we weren't able to get data on, uh, unfortunately, so it uh, could be even, even more uh, terrible. Next slide, please. Uh, then we also looked at uh, innocent rates of people who have been incarcerated who were later found to uh, not have committed uh, the crimes that not only were they arrested for, uh, but actually were in prison. Uh, the National Registry of Exonerations, which looks at this data, uh, found that uh, African Americans were 12 times uh, more likely to be convicted uh, who were not guilty uh, of drug crimes than uh, white people who were not uh, convicted. And so while some of the focus is on making sure that there is absolutely fair uh, treatment and justice for individuals uh, who may have committed no offense, uh, and as they go through the system that they're treated equally and fairly, but we also focus on people who have absolutely committed no crime at all, uh, who end up uh, in prison. And that may be hard to, to imagine, uh, but it certainly happens all the time. And it happens in a very racially uh, disparate uh, way. Uh, similar, if you look in Manhattan, for example, again, when you go down to the uh, local levels, you see how the disparities uh, become even more charged uh, uh, when you uh, go through the data. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and even for those who are not necessarily arrested or uh, sent to jail, uh, traffic stops. Uh, one study that we found that was, uh, was stunning actually, uh, was looked at 95 million traffic stops. It basically looked at traffic stops over a long period from all over the country, a uh, total of nine, 95 million. And what it was able to discover was that uh, not only are African Americans stopped at much, much, much higher rates, but that is clearly driven by racial profiling because when it was broken down into drivers who were stopped during the day versus drivers who were stopped during the evening, uh, in other words, when it was easier to see what the driver actually looked like, the numbers became uh, very close in the evening versus during the day where these disparities uh, existed, which indicated that it was really looking at the driver uh, and then pulling these drivers over uh, and, and doing these traffic stops. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we also looked at uh, food and housing insecurity. Uh, these are areas, uh, again, that have not gotten a lot of attention. Uh, they've gotten more attention uh, this year because of the pandemic. And the data we looked at, as bad as it appears, is before uh, we have reached this crisis uh, now. Uh, you do not have to go far to see uh, the long, long, long lines of individuals and families uh, who are lining up uh, for food because people are uh, in very uh, desperate kinds of situations. Uh, but even before the pandemic, uh, this exists, and again, it was racially uh, disparate. Uh, black children, about three times more likely. Uh, Latino children, about 1.6 times more likely uh, to be food insecure. And by food insecure, it means that people are not sure where their next meal is coming from. Uh, certainly not what uh, their meals and food they will have uh, for the coming weeks or for the coming months. And so it's a very um, startling uh, situation to be in a country, uh, one of the most advanced countries in the world in 2020, and you've got millions of people. And again, you can see uh, them lined up every day uh, who are food insecure. Uh, and if you look at the chart uh, on, your, on the screen, uh, this has been persistent uh, over a longer period of time. You see some degree of drop uh, with uh, Black and Latino communities uh, in between uh, 2015 and 2018. Uh, but those numbers have risen again, and again, even before the pandemic, and now they are sharply rising uh, as a result of the, the situation people find themselves in. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, one uh, area that has contributed to uh, this situation has been the loss of land uh, by black farmers as well as by uh, indigenous communities. Uh, the indigenous communities, of course, as, as Elena alluded to at the very beginning, uh, lost virtually all of the land uh, that was originally uh, in tribal hands. Uh, but even after, uh, even in the 21st century, uh, that land loss uh, is still continuing and that has had an impact on people's ability uh, to grow food and to uh, develop provisions for themselves. And in a similar way, uh, African-American farmers, uh, which at the beginning of the 20th century uh, owned hundreds and hundreds of thousands of land, peaking at almost a million by 1920, uh, that's fallen down to about 45,000 uh, black farmers uh, to date. And you still have a number of important uh, organizations that are working to uh, save the black, save black farms, uh, but that's gonna require some policy intervention, which I'll talk about in one second. Next slide, please. Uh, can we go back one to Rent Burton? Yeah, there. All right, thank you. And then uh, coupled with the crisis that we're seeing every day around food insecurity, uh, there's also housing insecurity. And it's pretty well documented uh, that by the end of this year, uh, both renters as well as homeowners uh, all face the possibility of being uh, out on the street. And that again is disproportionate. About 53% of Latino households, 55% of black households. And again, this data was collected uh, prior to, to the current crisis uh, compared to other households. Uh, and if we look in certain areas, New Mexico, Hawaii, Montana, and Vermont, more than two thirds of black households uh, are rent burdened. Uh, as Elena alluded to uh, in her remarks, uh, the purpose of looking at uh, what, what she referred to as repair, uh, the necessity of addressing these issues uh, requires public policy. And what we hope this report will do, and my colleagues will, will go over this more, is it will lay the basis and the, the uh, groundwork for beginning to deal with uh, policy solutions uh, that can address these concerns. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Helen, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Clarence, for that. And thank you all of us again for joining us uh, today. Um, I want to say before we get into the racial disparity aspect of it that we used as a case study, that we did not forget the domain of education. We just didn't have enough time to actually cover it. Just two things about that though, when you log into the report, or you see maybe the original slides, that uh, there were two disparities in education in terms of the racial and ethnic demographics of the teacher population in comparison with the student population. And we also looked at uh, the racial disproportionalities in school discipline that actually affects uh, the racial, uh, the achievement gap between groups. But we're going into now the racial disparity in COVID-19 in the United States. Thank you, Elaine, if you would advance that slide, please. Thank you. We used, <clears throat> looking at this data, we used COVID-19 and the situation on the ground as the lived experience of this data. What does this data look like when it's experienced uh, among a pandemic? And we use the notion of, um, you know, looking at uh, the disparities across the groups and how they sort of correlated uh, in people uh, that were being infected and dying of COVID-19. And the data that we used for this, it came from the COVID tracking project uh, that's in partnership with the Center for Anti-Racist Research, uh, now at Boston University. And to let you know that the data that we are using for this uh, is actually the data that uh, is used by John Hopkins, as well as many of your news stations. And you have open access to this data. And what I wanna talk about, I wanna show a little bit, 
even though, and if we'll go to the next slide, I think will be a good one to introduce that next point. Thank you, Elena. This is what we've been hearing about nationwide, um, that black and brown and indigenous people are dying at so much of a higher rate. And I just downloaded the slide literally uh, last night just to get the most, because the data uh, on the COVID tracking project is updated daily. And this is the, the latest. Then you can see just the visual disparity of who is actually dying black people at two times the rate of, of white people. Um, and what I've decided to do with this section is to look at some state by state disparities, not just looking at so how many people are dying per state, but look at how that data is being collected and the inconsistencies across the data collection around race and ethnicity. And while we have this picture before us, if we had better data, if we had more consistent data, I'm going to show you where some states aren't collecting data on some of these groups at all. They might be collecting it, some might not be publishing all of it, but there are really uh, disparities across that. And so when you look at this picture, you wonder, you know, what would this picture actually look like? I think we do see the trends, but if there was more consistent data collection. Uh, across the state. So if we'll go to the next slide, thank you. Just to give you a, just a quick overview, you can see this on the COVID racial data tracking site on how they calculate a racial and ethnic disparity. And, you know, it's flagged as suggestive when it meets the following three criteria, is at least 33% higher than the census percentage of what they represent in the population, remains elevated whether we include or exclude cases or death with unknown race or ethnicity, and is based on at least 30 actual cases or deaths. So there is definitely some patterns, even uh, in this uh, universe of really inconsistent data and data collection. Thank you, next slide, please. I want to start out with the District of Columbia because and if you go to the COVID data tracking project, you can look at this data state by state and to see, you know, the reported race data, the reported ethnicity data. And I wanted to start out with a part of the country that was actually doing the best around reporting this. And it actually is District of Columbia, even though it's not a state, uh, but it is doing the best in terms of reporting, if you look, 100% for race data, 100% of cases, and 99% of deaths. Uh, I didn't include the ethnicity part, but they also reporting very high percentages of that. So when you look at the disparate outcomes, you have some confidence in them. Uh, Black or African American alone, 47% of the population in Washington, D.C., 47% of cases, and yet 75% percentage of deaths. And what I have outlined in red, that's where the COVID data tracking project has actually flagged uh, a racial and ethnic disparity as, as being likely. So we'll go to the next one. And I've given some more case studies, um, you know, as we move forward. Next slide, if you would, please, thank you. We're gonna go to Idaho. Uh, these states weren't picked just randomly, uh, they really, I wanted to show you the inconsistent picture across the United States. Reported, so they report ethnicity data, that's for uh, the Latinx and Hispanic population, for only 51% of cases and 98% of deaths. So deaths, almost 100%, but only 51% of the actual cases. So when you look at the disparate outcomes, um, uh, 12 American Indian, Alaska Native, representing 12% of the population, yet 30% of, uh, of the cases and 12 percentage of the deaths. And you see the uh, very high racial uh, disparity there. Uh, and certainly there needs to be uh, more representation in, in uh, uh, reporting the number of cases there. If we could go to the next slide. Great. This is Montana. 
interesting here. Uh, in terms of race data, 76% uh, of cases, but only 65% of deaths. I was actually comparing this last night to the last time I presented this. And uh, for Montana, in terms of uh, ethnicity, they're uh, reporting 61% of cases, but you notice 0% of deaths. They're actually not reporting deaths at all. And uh, the last time that I presented on this, they uh, actually have improved uh, and they were reporting 54% of ethnicity. Now they're reporting 61%, but still 0% of deaths. And look at the impact on the disparate outcomes. How well can you get a picture of that when the reporting um, is so poorly? Um, for the American Indians, they represent 6% of Montana's population, but 13% of cases and 28% of deaths. To get a better picture of that, we need better data on the left-hand side. Thank you. We'll go to the next state. Just a few more and we'll look at some patterns very quickly. North Dakota, similar situation, but worse, really. Uh, the missing data, they reported race data for 71% of cases, but 0% of deaths. 0% of deaths, let me say that again, was reported in terms for race data out of North Dakota. And for ethnicity, for Hispanic and Latino populations, 0% of cases and 0% of deaths. And I'm just looking down, I was just noting the last time that I presented, uh, that has not improved for um, actually the re reporting percentages are exactly the same. Look at the disparate outcomes on the, on the next uh, picture there, uh, moving over. How much we can trust that, are we seeing the full picture? Certainly not when you're not you know, reporting uh, data for some groups. But for African Americans, 3% of the population in North Dakota and 5% uh, of cases. Uh, and of course, we have no idea of the deaths because they are not being reported. Next slide, please. South Dakota, reporting race and ethnicity data for race and ethnicity, 100% of cases, 100% of deaths. American Indian, Alaska Native, we have, we, we have more confidence in the, the disparate outcomes when we look at what's being reported. Uh, they are 8% of the population, 12% of cases, 18 percentage of deaths. Uh, and what's highlighted in red is where there is a racial and ethnic disparity likely. Just a couple more, just to give you a range around the United States. Next slide, if you would, please. Thank you, Texas. Um, uh, really uh, interesting here, reporting race and ethnicity data, only 6% of cases, but we do get 99% of deaths, but we need a higher percentage of cases. And you can see the disparate outcomes among Indian and Alaskan natives, huge disparities uh, in Texas uh, for American Indian and Alaskan native. 39% of population of Texas representing 45% of cases, although um, we have some misreporting there, uh, and 54 percentage of deaths, a really a huge racial ethnic disparity, certainly there. Next slide, and we'll be wrapping up here shortly. Vermont is an example of, although they're not at 100% across the board, they seem to be doing a fairly good job reporting race data, 94% of cases, 100% of deaths, ethnicity, Hispanic, Latino, 88% of cases, 100% of deaths. We do have, however, uh, disparate outcomes in the Asian American population that represents 2% of the population in Vermont, yet 4% of the cases and 3% of the deaths. So a disparity in terms of cases, the reason why we need to make sure that we have full reporting of all those cases. Next slide, if you would, I have another minute or so. I wanted to include West Virginia. It's an interesting state in terms of reporting 100% of cases, 100% of deaths, yet zero, zero, reporting no percentage of cases in terms of ethnicity, 0% of deaths 
in regards to ethnicity. Uh, and uh, yet they do have quite uh, disparities in terms of some other race alone uh, and how they calculate and understand that particular category. Okay, I, it's two, I'm about a minute or two over, so if I can just take a minute to wrap up, we'll go to the next slide. Um, the reason, and I think this has been reiterated very well by my colleagues, why we need consistent uh, and timely uh, data collection to really understand the pandemic to its fullest extent. And you can see just by sampling, if you look at all the states across our wonderful union, you're going to see the same dis, um, discontinuous inconsistent pattern. We need to focus efforts and messaging that are culturally responsive, uh, and we need the correct information, the data to do that, ensure equitable access to testing and treatment, and to ensure equitable distribution in terms of resources, in terms of preparedness, even as we move forward with the vaccine uh, distribution. Uh, I think that's, uh, let's see what we have for the next slide here. And our conclusion, and, I, and I'll let you read this if you want a copy of the slides on your own, but what I did was to look back and look internationally at the calls for uh, disaggregated data. 2007, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe calling for attention to data regarding subpopulations, regarding gender. Committee on the Elimination of the Forms of Racial Discrimination calling governments to provide racial and ethnic data regarding education and employment. And again, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women uh, being uh, asking states for data stratified by both gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, uh, so the need to do this is, has been ongoing and internationally. I'll end with that and turn it back over to my colleague. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Helen. I'm Clarence, I'd invite you to turn back on your um, video as well. Um, I, yeah, I would now turn it over to everyone in on the call and I'd love to hear questions um, that you might have around this project um, or things that you'd be interested in learning more about. Um, we also have some questions for you also. After that, um, we'll turn back to you. Um, maybe as we um, get started, um, maybe I'll turn it to you first, Clarence, and ask, you know, how, what do you th see as the next steps in terms of moving this into policy? Do you see there, uh, there to be a policy opening available? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, one of the things that uh, we do with data, and I, I would mention that I uh, worked on Capitol Hill for uh, about seven or eight years working on a uh, different range of uh, issues. Uh, one of the things that's critical for developing policy is data. Uh, you have to have the right information. You have to have correct information. And one of the things that we need to do right now is what I would call a racial policy audit, where at the federal level, the state level, and the local level, we look at not only existing policy, but proposed policy to address these issues and assess that policy for its adequacy. And if it's unable to address these questions, then we need new policy. And so that's where we're at now. And this involves not just policymakers, but people who have the vested interest in these policy changes, from church leaders to community leaders to academics to community activists to educators. And so there's a broad spectrum of uh, stakeholders uh, that need to be brought together, uh, again, around not you know, our report, but you know, data, again, that begins to assess uh, all of the, uh, uh, and identify the reality of the experiences that people are having. Thanks for that. Helen, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. No, I, I um, along with that racial uh, audit, I, I would like to, to say would be a uh, unique call and for more consistent data reporting and gathering, um, which, uh, and I didn't include in the presentation, there was a, um, researcher from uh, Harvard that actually termed it as a form of discrimination 
in and among itself if you are not collecting, reporting, um, and acting on. We included that, uh, that Harvard professor reported that, um, you know, if you're not reporting or collecting, but I'd like to add, if you're not acting on data, that you know where there are disparate outcomes, that is a form of inequality of racial and ethnic discrimination in America. Thank you, some really important points. Um, I see we have a question in the Q&A. It says, how is this presented in terms of SDG metrics and terms? Maybe I'll, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll turn it over to the, the two of you. Um, so we started by, by grouping this thematically by SDG and, and we used the basis of our state index, which is grouped thematically by SDG. So the underlying backbone of this report is the SDGs and in the index um, and dashboards that will be published um, in the new year, um, that is organized by SDGs as well. So I don't know if you're familiar with previous reports, but um, we, we organize by score in SDG and, um, and we give a score for each SDG as well as overall. So that's the underlying backbone, but this report was really um, for a, a, a general audience. So we kept the SDG backbone. Um, and when we talk about food and housing insecurity, we talk about how that relates to goal two as well as goal 10 um, and all of those pieces, as well as the idea of this underlying framework and the SDGs of the leave no one behind agenda, um, which really requires that those who are furthest, who have been the least served by their governments receive the most attention and resources first. And so we believe this is a way to move forward um, in that agenda by understanding which groups have been the least served and how to um, prioritize that reparation. I don't know if Helen or Clarence, you wanna add anything? The only thing I would add is that in the report, uh, to a limited degree, we also do some international comparison. So we look at how incarceration rates and, and other data compares on a global scale. And I also would, would like to add, this is one of, we, we haven't seen many in terms of research using the SDGs as a metric for accountability for racial uh, inequality. And so in a sense and in spirit, we are arguing that the SDGs are certainly uh, a metric for, as they are defined, peace, prosperity for all, uh, looking at environmental and sustainability issues, but understanding that the backbone of that requires uh, you know, racial and ethnic equality uh, as one of the fibers that actually hold those, uh, connects the SDGs across uh, the 17 uh, indicators. So thank you for that question. Um, there's another question, um, or it seems like a comment, and it was saying that, um, that this project will not just look into data, but also policies that have led to disparities. Um, and that mission to actively point to policies which have caused disparities will be great. Yeah, I think, you know, in this report, we only scratched the surface of probably um, all of those policies. I don't know if uh, Helen or Clarence, you want to talk about that approach to talk about the policies that have led to these disparities. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, for that comment. That's absolutely right. So, for example, when we look at housing uh, and we look at, you know, uh, and Helen, uh, did a lot of the research and we look at redlining. Uh, there are a number of what were federal and state and local policies that contributed for decades uh, to what we see as the outcomes now of the housing insecurity, uh, the wealth gap, the income gap uh, that exists. There's a very good book called Color of Law, uh, which traces uh, in some detail the uh, federal policy that shaped how the country looks in terms of housing. And the absolute uh, hard line segregation uh, that was um, uh, part of that policy. And so the, the comment is really appropriate uh, that it's not just the absence of policy to address these issues, but the history of policy uh, that has led to the uh, disparities that we're witnessing. 
absolutely. And I'll add a little bit to, uh, uh, to that, uh, even though we didn't have time to talk in depth about the uh, education section. Uh, and Elena illuminated that we have some missing data around segregated schooling. But what data we, we do have uh, suggest that schools are more segregated now than they were at the time of Brown v. Board. And when you look at Brown v. Board, of course, and we, we actually discuss policies that were sort of paralleling at the time uh, with the Hispanic Latino population, similar uh, court cases that were going on. But Brown v. Board has been challenged and really broken down in the courts and have been watered down so in fact, even though we celebrate it, and it is one of the greatest uh, uh, civil rights um, uh, edicts uh, that we celebrate all the time, but in practice, it's been broken down through the courts. And what you see actually on the ground is schools being very much so uh, segregated with white students as being one of the most segregated populations. Uh, and you're seeing this coupling together of African-American, black and brown students uh, being coupled together through, and when you think about policies, how wide reaching uh, 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 that is, you're looking at how neighborhoods and, and um, um, gentrification and white flight um, and, and just the way schooling now is structured, having uh, charter schools and private schools. And so there are a lot of factors there. Uh, that actually uh, play a role, but you can definitely trace all of that back to specific and certain policies that have played out and you can see the, um, the impact on the ground. And I'd also like to say along with that, that we were able to pull all that and we did some policy analysis as much as we could within the confines of the report, but we use a social determinants of health model. And when you look at that, Take for instance in education, and people are thinking, well, you know, how does education actually connect with what you're seeing happening in COVID 19? And we were able to show that people with less education were more likely to be in customer or consumer facing roles, such as cashier or a bus driver, and therefore more highly, you know, exposed. People with less education, poor people less likely to have health insurance. So there's a connection, a web, if you want to think about it, sort of as a, a web and how things all sort of come together and produce this, um, of what I like to call a constellation of inequalities. Uh, and that's another connection back to the SDGs. The SDGs, 17, indi you know, 17 indi indicators, you have 169 sub-indicators that sort of pull a lot of these things together. And we were able to see what was contributing to COVID-19 on the ground was you could just draw a jagged or a somewhat straight line back to many of these policies and lived experiences on the ground. So I'll end with that. Hopefully there'll be some more questions around it. Thank you. Thanks both. Um, I would like now to, to ask you all, you know, one of the things, one of the important pieces of this work um, was to figure out how to move this into policy and actually make um, policy changes. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully you all will see this Mentimeter. Uh, at the top, there's a code to put in if you go to menti.com. We would love to hear what are your ideas uh, for moving this into policy? Are there um, strategies? you know, at whatever level, at the local level, at the state level, at the national level, do you see openings? Um, are you working in places where you think um, there's a place where this could fit in? Um, how do you think this type of work could move into the policy arena? Um, and I'd love um, for you all to, to fill in your thoughts there. And maybe while I give everyone a minute to do that, I'll just answer one last question that popped up around the criteria. Um, Hi, David. David is a colleague of ours at SDSN. Um, when you include indicators not in SDSN USA indicator set, um, what criteria guided your choices? So I'll say that we used the same criteria that we used for SDG indicators. So it had to be from a reputable source. The source had to be open access. Um, it had to be um, easily and frequently updated. Um, there had to be rigorous uh, data collection processes. Um, and there had to be an opportunity to set a target 
Um, so there had to be some way that you could say what would be the optimal level. Um, and you can find, if you're interested in those details, it's in the methodology of our report on how exactly we did that. I'm refreshing the screen um, to see what's happening on uh, menti.com. And we have a suggestion to establish a coalition of researchers and policymakers, which I'm very happy to see as a coalition of researchers and policymakers who are joined here today. So I don't know if um, that's great. I'm do any um, I'd love to hear feedback or thoughts from uh, either of you on that, that idea. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, you, it can't be done by policymakers sort of separate from uh, the community and people who actually are experts in the areas. And then uh, for folks who want to make policy change, just doing the research and sort of putting it on the shelf uh, or bookshelf or any other shelf uh, is also uh, inadequate. So you, we really do need these uh, cross uh, overs. Uh, and again, I would involve the communities that are impacted uh, as part of that coalition. Uh, I I'm see. Uh, oh, go ahead, Helen. I see a comment around the collection of race-related data for every COVID patient should be a law. Uh, definitely, there needs to be certainly national leadership around the collection of this data, which is primarily state-based. But you can see that. Wow, the, the the inconsistencies in regard to, to collection. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, uh, it absolutely should be mandatory uh, because without the data, you just cannot develop effective policy. Absolutely. Um, I see the suggestion around decision support tools um, and I'd love to hear more about what that means um, from where you're sitting in your position. So if you're interested, please follow up with us um, because I'd love to hear what kinds of things might be useful in that way. Um, I'll, I'll just switch um, quickly um, to, or maybe I won't because my screen is now frozen. Um, you'd like to hear more about how you'd like to be involved. So um, Caroline, I think, has posted a link in the um, chat. Um, and we'd love to hear you know, what might be interesting to you, um, how, how we might take this further, what other things haven't we done that we could do, how we might collaborate um, and be involved with the things you're already doing. Um, and here's a link to, to tell us more about what we might do. Um, Helen, I don't know if you'd like to speak briefly about some plans you have in the new year. Yes. Uh, I was just thinking about one of the comments uh, to gather a coalition of policymakers and researchers. That is exactly what we have in mind uh, at SDSN is to, I uh, will be looking forward to working with SDSN and developing a working group around racial inequality in respect to uh, the uh, metrics provided uh, by the sustainable development goals. So <clears throat> look forward to hearing more about that. I look forward to leading that and uh, to um, maybe uh, involving the policy community uh, and uh, that way more, more directly. So look forward to hearing more about that. I look forward to your uh, participation and, um, and thank you. Um, if I might just expand on that. Um, I think Helen is going to be leading a really um, critical group and I'm very excited that it will be hosted here at SDSN. Um, one of the things we're also thinking about are who are other organizations that are thinking about data gaps? How what might we collaborate? Or are there researchers who are working to fill these gaps? Um, I know that um, Data for Black Lives is one group that's doing really incredible work. The Black Mamas Matter movement is also doing really incredible work around that. If you or an organization you're part of or aware of um, is doing some work that we might collaborate with or get connected to. Um, I'd love it if you share in this forum or connect via email. I think that'd be really, we'd love to be connected and work collaboratively on that as well. Um, 
Okay. Any um, closing remarks as we end this work, uh, this webinar? Thank you so much to everyone for your participation and your ideas. Um, it's been an honor to be able to share this hour with you. Thank you for giving us your time. I know how precious it is, especially right now. Um, and I'll turn it over to Helen and Clarence for the very last word. Yeah, I just want to say thank you as well. Uh, each time we do this, we learn something new, we get new information, new insights. Uh, so we do see this as a dynamic and living project. Uh, so again, I just want to extend my thanks as well. Yes, I'd like to extend my thanks to all the listening audience, as well as to SDSN, as well as to all the researchers that uh, SDSN and we have reached out to. And we do encourage you to go online and if there's a link in the chat, I'm sure there is. Thanks to Carolyn Fox for doing that. Uh, please do go and read the report in full. And we'd love to hear your comments further. So thank you very much. Thank you all.